Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. It's wonderful to see everyone here this afternoon. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and we're delighted to have all of you here with us for the first of our policy talks for 2015, and we hope many of you will continue to join us as our program unfolds. Um, we are particularly thankful to today's speakers, Luke Mogelson and Joel Lovell, who have joined us from afar, and so we appreciate them traveling here to join us, and also delighted to welcome my colleagues, Professor John Trichari and Susan Waltz. Um, we will be doing special invitation, uh, not invitations, introductions, excuse me, um, in just a few moments, um, but I did want to just say a couple of words before turning things over to my uh, partner in organizing this, this event. Um, this event, as you'll see, really highlights some of the important interactions between public policy and journalism, and that is something that we think is particularly interesting and important, and we're delighted to be having this joint partnership in that context. And so I'm very grateful to our co-sponsors, the Livingston Award for uh, Young Journalists and its director, Charles Eisendroth. And in a moment, Charles will be introducing our speakers, as I have just mentioned. Um, but I did want to say just a bit about him before I turn the podium over to him. Um, following a very dynamic international career in journalism, which spanned D.C. and London and Paris and Buenos Aires and perhaps some other places as well, he came to the University of Michigan as a journalism fellow in 1974 and then began running the Journalism Master's Program. His writing and his commentary have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Detroit Free Press, and the list goes on and on. And I'm sure that many of you have read a number of his pieces. Um, for the past three decades, he has been the director of the Knight Wallace Fellows Program, and he also is the founding director for the Livingston Awards, and you'll be hearing a little bit more about that program as well. Both of these, of course, are extremely successful programs that really are committed to the intellectual development and professional advancement of journalists. And just this past spring, Charles was inducted into the Michigan Journalism Hall of Fame. Congratulations. Um, and that's an honor that is very, very well deserved. Um, let me just say a quick note about the format today. So following the panel discussion, our speakers will take questions from the audience. You should have received a card as you joined us, and we encourage you to write your questions down on the cards that were passed. We'll be collecting them um, at various stages later on this afternoon. And I'd ask you also at the bottom if you would tell us your affiliation with the university. Are you a student? Are you a faculty member? Are you a member of the community? Um, that would be helpful, I think, as, as we frame uh, responses. Um, a volunteer, volunteers will collect those. Um, if you are watching us online, we encourage you to tweet your questions using the hashtag policy talks. And the Q&A will be facilitated by one of our Masters in Public Policy students, uh, Carlos, Carlos Robles, and one of our uh, Knight Wallace Fellows, Helen Maynard. Actually, I think we have two, um, Helen Maynard and Abby Swanson. So we're delighted to have all of you here to facilitate our Q&A session at the end. And so it is now my great pleasure to turn the podium over to Charles Eisendrath. Welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you had an easier time uh, parking than I did. I ended up uh, in a small pile up in the, uh, the Ford School lot, which we are trying to disentangle. Uh, and so if you see me disappear and talk to a policeman, that's why. <laughs> uh, uh, welcome. It's wonderful to have you all here. I can see right now it's a very diverse audience. I thought I'd better explain a little bit about the Livingston Awards and why uh, I would say all of you are hearing about this program for the first time, even though it's been at the university for 30 years. The reason is that like um, anything in the United States, uh, most things, the work goes on in the, in the hinterland, that's where we live, and the glory goes on in New York City. And so uh, the prizes are given in New York City at a great big glitzy lunch, and all the work is done by, by Melissa Riley and the other people in Wallace House right here in Ann Arbor. By the work, I mean uh, four or five hundred, five hundred at least, uh, submissions to this prize. 
uh, come into Wallace House, which is on Oxford Road, and they are reduced in number from 500 to about 50. They are sent to some of the uh, foremost journalists in the country. Right now, it's a news anchor. It is several columnists. It is the editor of the New York Times. And they make the decision on who wins this prize. So it's a fairly big prize, $10,000. But the biggest prize is who gives it to the young journalists. This is a prize. It's a Pulitzer Prize for the young. It's limited to people under the age of 35. And it's, I, the idea is to identify the leaders in journalism before they are identified some other way, and to send them on their way as quickly as possible. And to give you an idea of how well it works, and I'm not claiming credit for this, I want, I want to give the credit to the judges of this award. They include uh, people like Christian Amanpour. Uh, they include people like the editor of The New Yorker. They include uh, uh, Ira Glass, who, uh, whose name will come up in a minute, who founded This American Life, Thomas Friedman of The New York Times, and on and on and on. These were uh, young people wet behind the ears when they were uh, trotted up in front of a lot of very important people in journalism, like 150 of them, and basically blessed. And what they do after that is, of course, due to their own talent. But anyway, it gets them on their way. Because it's a little unknown, I brought along two things. That I'll, that I'll hand around. This is a uh, the small one, is a uh, brochure describing the lunch. You'll see who the judges are and who the winners were. And this is all the winners' pieces, including uh, the one by Luke Mogelson, which, uh, who's our, one of our speakers today. Uh, so that's what we're, we're doing here. Uh, just last year, we added a feature to the prize program, which is to take the winners or invite the winners to address audiences around the country on the subject to audiences that will be particularly interested in their piece that won the Livingston Award. In this case, Luke's piece is on the refugee problem, who makes it, basically. This is a man who uh, specializes in survival and survival writing. Uh, his piece, um, he has a piece coming out of the New Yorker today. Uh, on who survives Ebola and why and why not. Let me give you a small introduction about uh, Luke. Uh, we have two things in common. One is that we published our first piece in the Nation magazine. The second is for God knows why he was in the Army National Guard, the 69th uh, Infantry Division, but I know why I was in the 29th Infantry Division, and that was to avoid going to Vietnam. Uh, We'll hear, maybe we'll hear about Luke's reasons later. <laughs> but at any rate, he has uh, done work all over the country, including Michigan. And the piece that he wrote was in the New York Times Magazine. Uh, it's a piece on how survivors, uh, I mean, how refugees survive or don't survive. I mentioned the New York Times Magazine last because it's a good bridge to our other speaker, Joel Lovell. Joel Lovell was the editor of uh, the New York Times Magazine, or second in command editor. And he now works for the Atavist and This American Life, said piece from uh, Ira Glass, who invented the thing. But he uh, started right here in a creative writing program. And then in a great move downward, he was my first assistant <laughs> at Wallace House. And I must say that he was uh, hopelessly <laughs> overqualified for that uh, position. And every time I passed him in the hall, he looked somewhat baffled at what he was supposed to be doing. And uh, I could not give him much guidance because I wasn't <laughs> sure myself. <laughs> at any rate, he has, uh, he's gone on to great glory and is still there. <clears throat> I think at this point I will turn this over to John um, of your faculty, and he will start the panel going. We are here really to explore, with your help, uh, the refugee issue. And, and the most creative ways to address it, uh, not only in journalism, but in policy. And that's where you come in. John? Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, very pleased, of course, to welcome Luke and Joel as well. Uh, I'm John Chorchari. I co-direct the International Policy Center here, and I'm an assistant professor at the Ford School. Many of you also know Susan Waltz, who's a professor of practice and uh, both an expert scholar and a practitioner of human rights internationally. Uh, 
Today we're going to use Luke's story, The Dream Boat, to look at some of the human side of the refugee crisis, also some of the role of the media, and the evolution of some of the relevant laws and policies relating to refugees. After decades of both official actors and civil society groups trying to develop stronger protections for refugees, millions and millions of people around the world still embark on perilous journeys with very, very uncertain prospects of protection at the other end uh, in, their, in their places of destination. And so what we're going to do is we're going to begin with a uh, panel presentation and then have Q&A, as Susan mentioned. Luke and Joel are going to start by having a conversation about the piece uh, in their roles as the author and as the editor of The Dream Boat, respectively. And then Susan and I will follow. I'll talk a little bit about the relevant law, and Susan will conclude by discussing some of the institutional framework for managing uh, asylum-seeking flows uh, and also some of the various options that asylum seekers may have uh, when searching for protection. So, Luke and Joel, please, we'd like to start with you. Great. Thanks, John. Um, thanks to, to, the, to the Ford School and to Charles and Melissa and the Livingston uh, Awards for bringing us here. It's really, really nice to be here. I was a student here 20 years ago, so it's really nice to be back. Um, Luke and I were talking earlier, we figured the best way to do this would be for us just to talk about how this story came into being. So how, um, how and why he initially became interested in this topic, and then how the reporting unfolded, uh, decisions that he made along the way in terms of the reporting and, and the writing, and then from my end, which is much less um, interesting, uh, what sort of thing, what sort of issues came up at the times when we were thinking about uh, the publication of the piece. Um, as you can imagine, the, you know, the refugee, the stories of refugees and asylum seekers are simultaneously incredibly, um, incredibly important as an issue and also really, really hard to tell in a way that, um, that's interesting. There are, all sorts of, um, there are all sorts of obstacles to reporting these stories in any, with any kind of intimacy. And so, um, so we tend to see stories that have a little bit of a similar flavor to them over and over. And, um, and then those stories you know, those stories can kind of feel uh, familiar to readers and, 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 and it becomes hard to reach an audience. And then once in a while, not very often in my experience, somebody comes along and does something like Luke did and sort of cracks the issue open uh, and makes it very vital and fresh in a way that, at least in my case, I'd never experienced quite before. So, um, so we just thought we would talk through the, the process of how this happened. And I guess I'll just start by asking Luke, who at the time was, um, he was living in Kabul and reporting for the Times Magazine and had done a few stories for us from there. Uh, and then he had the idea of doing this piece and, uh, and I'll just let him take it from there and explain at least the, what the, the germ of this story was. Hi, so that was basically the summer of 2013 and um, the surge was over uh, and the phased withdrawal of, of American troops was beginning um, and there was a lot of anxiety in the country and about the future and also about the present. And more Afghans were fleeing the country and seeking asylum abroad than ever before. Um, and the photographer, Yoel Van Hute and I wanted to address that story somehow. Um, and we thought as well that the, that illustrating the kind of extreme lengths that Afghans were willing to go to, to escape their country would also implicitly illustrate how bad things were there. Um, and there was no better example of that than, than this boat journey that, uh, that Afghans were taking across the Indian Ocean because a lot of them died on the way. So that was the original idea and uh, it then became just a question of how to execute it. Sorry, thanks. And so, um, uh, I actually don't remember the answer to this. So you, you have the initial idea, and then how do you go about figuring out 
literally how people make this trip. Like, what, what do they have to do in order to set themselves on their way? Yeah, that, that, wasn't, so diff that wasn't so difficult because, um, you know, I had a lot of friends who were, a lot of Afghan friends who were trying to leave the country. Basically, everybody I knew um, in Kabul and outside of, outside of Kabul and in the provinces at that time was trying to get out or at least thinking about ways to get out. Um, and that includes, you know, rural villagers and urbanites who with university education. Uh, so it's just common knowledge that, you know, if you want to go to, if you wanted to go to Australia, you uh, got in contact with uh, uh, one of about a half dozen smugglers who orchestrated, um, who orchestrated the, the trip from abroad and, uh, and you paid them, you made a down payment to them via what's called the Hawala system, um, which is essentially a form of, uh, of transferring money between Muslim countries. Um, and so that's what we did. We, I had a friend uh, in Kabul who pretended to be kind of an aspiring recruiter of asylum seekers and he contacted this smuggler uh, who went by the honorific Haji Sahib. That's not his real name, it's his common honorific. And, uh, and then we went, to the, we went to the money market in Kabul, a place called Sarai Shazada, and, and paid $8,000 to a guy um, behind a desk and he, in turn, gave us um, two numbers, our Hawala codes. <laughs> and basically, the way that works is, is the person we paid the cash to uh, was going to hold on to the funds until we arrived at uh, our destination, which, uh, which was a small island in Australian territorial waters called Christmas Island. And at that point, he would release or actually another uh, Hawala vendor in Jakarta would release the payment to Haji Sahib. So if you're, so if you're in Afghan and you, and you want to leave, you go to this money market, you pay $8,000, the money gets put. It's 4,000 per person. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. And then the money gets, the money basically gets held until you reach your destination, at which point it's paid to. Yeah, who? it gets paid to the smuggler got at it. that point, yeah. <laughs> so that, it's a way of guaranteeing that they don't, just take your money without getting you to, to, to the island. Uh, so maybe I should provide some more context on why people are going to, yeah. to this island because basically the, the, there are very few ways out of Afghanistan. It's a landlocked country and, and the countries uh, that are contiguous with its borders are, are uh, problematic um, for Afghans and, and difficult to travel through. But uh, there was, there's, you can fly to Jakarta pretty easily. Um, and from there, you can, it's only 200 miles across the ocean to, um, to this small island off the mainland of Australia called Christmas Island. And uh, prior to 2001, if you got to Christmas Island, that would, mean that the Australian government was obligated to consider your um, application for protection under the Refugee Convention. Uh, that later changed um, with a policy known as the Pacific Solution, um, where, they started, uh, where they started interdicting boats at sea and also diverting people who did arrive in Christmas Island to other countries, namely Papua New Guinea and the Republic of Nauru, which, and, and, and simultaneously they excised Christmas, the waters around Christmas Island from the mainland's immigration zone, thus freeing their, uh, themselves from honoring uh, their commitment to the convention, the refugee convention. So basically people, once they arrived at Christmas Island would be sent to these detention centers in Papua New Guinea and the Republic of Nauru. Um, 
And, uh, and that, that policy never really got back to the, <laughs> to the Afghans, Iraqis, Iranians, um, Syrians, who were trying to go to Australia. So they were still continuing to go. Um, and, there, and there was also a large Hazara uh, diaspora in Australia already who had gone there during the Taliban regime. The Hazara are a Shia ethnic minority in Afghanistan that were just brutally persecuted um, by, the, by the Sunni Taliban. So after uh, the American invasion, um, when things started getting bad again in Afghanistan, Hazaras resumed trying to reach Australia to join this diaspora, basically. And, and yet they were unaware of the change in the Australian yeah, they, approach. Or they were aware but didn't believe it. Right, right. Yeah. So, so then back to you, you go, and when you show up in the money market, you can't say, obviously, we're a couple journalists looking to do this. So, so how did that work exactly? Oh, right. So we, yeah, <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, yeah, so we had to come up with basically cover stories and identities and we chose to be Georgian. Why? Uh, <laughs> so, Why Georgian? <laughs> yeah, well, we're obviously Caucasian. Yoel is, is Dutch, I'm American. Uh, we're obviously Caucasian, and we were worried about running into Russian speakers along the way, and, and so we, that eliminated a lot of countries. Uh, <laughs> And then, you know, someone said, what about Georgia? <laughs> so, and thus the Livingston Award was born. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, although we were very apprehensive about running into a Georgian. That, that would have... so, 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 so then, once the deposit is made, you guys get on a plane, you fly to Jakarta, and, and what happens there? So yeah, we, we flew to Jakarta, then I called Haji Sahib when we, you know, shortly after we arrived, and he sent uh, somebody to pick us up at, uh, outside of a 7-Eleven at a, an appointed time. And that person, it was a local Indonesian man, brought us to a safe house on the outskirts of Jakarta, which is this really tall kind of apartment tower complex uh, right on, uh, right in the slums, uh, on Jakarta Bay, and uh, and there we joined a couple dozen asylum seekers, who were in this kind of limbo, waiting for a boat to to depart uh, from the island to uh, to Christmas Island. And just to, just to give a little context. It, um, you know, roughly how many boats are going out, going from Jakarta or other places to Christmas Island? Well, and how frequently and for how long? Yeah, at that, at that point, they were going about once a week or once every couple weeks. It depends because they, you know, they have to recruit local fishermen to, to captain the boats. In some cases, they have to build the boats. And then they have to have enough people on them, well, as many people as possible, to maximize uh, the profits because the boats are, uh, once they cross, the boats are confiscated by the Australian Navy and, and destroyed, uh, or scuttled in, in, in the, in the uh, ocean off the coast of Christmas Island. So, to, you know, to rec recoup all that overhead and, and also just to make as much money as possible, they, they, they really wait until they have the boat packed. And so there were people in there who had been waiting for months. Um, oh, and also you, you have to pay off the Indonesian officials. You have to make sure that the people you have paid off are on duty. Um, and you have to coordinate among a network of, uh, of drivers and people on the beach for it all to, for the transportation of the people, which is about, it can be 60 to 70 people that you're moving from these safe houses to the, to the coast. And then, and then leaving without being seen. And, uh, and it just takes time. And there had been people waiting in, in, this, in this apartment for months uh, 
with no money, no cash, and they were really, uh, it was, it's, it's, it's very dispiriting to, to, to be in that kind of purgatory for that long. I'm just going to interrupt here to say that, that, that so while Luke was reporting the story, um, as his editor back in New York, of course, and, 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 and the, the other people at the Times who knew he was doing this, we were, waiting, we were waiting to hear news to make sure he was doing okay, but of course he couldn't openly communicate with us. Um, so, you know, every four or five days maybe, an email would come in, a very sort of terse email would come in saying, here in a safe house, staying with a family of however many people will write again when I can. Um, so I, I actually can't at the moment remember exactly how many days you and you all were there, but, um, but it's worth sort of, I, I, if you don't mind, describing the scene, the people there, the other yeah. asylum seekers. Yeah, we were there for, for a couple weeks, uh, a little longer, I think. And um, there were family, it was mostly, mostly men, uh, young men, some of whom had left their families uh, back in their home countries. Also, I didn't mention, it turned out once we got there that um, the vast majority of the asylum seekers uh, in Jakarta that we encountered were, were Iranian. They weren't Afghan. There were only a few Afghans. Um, so, and that was really surprising. I, we weren't expecting that. Uh, we, we had uh, intended to do a story on uh, Afghan refugees. And then when we finally did get on the boat, it was, it, there was only one Afghan. The rest were all, all Iranian. Um, but a lot of them had, yeah, they'd left family behind. Um, they were mainly lower middle class or middle class. You know, you had to have enough money to be able to pay this pretty steep fee to the, to the smuggler. So they weren't, uh, they weren't too impoverished. I mean, there were, among the people I spent time with, there, there was a barber, there was a builder, there was um, an imam, there was an engineer. And so it was really a wide range. Um, and some people traveling with their, with their kids as well. Yeah, so Yoel and I were put in a, in a little one-bedroom apartment with a man and his, two, and his young daughter and son. And uh, he had left his, his wife in Iran planning to bring her to Australia once they got there. And uh, yeah, they, and those kids were, I mean, they were relentlessly uh, optimistic and... and really handled the situation remarkably, remarkably well, yeah. Um. One thing that, um, in terms of the reporting, so, so uh, obviously in order to, to pay the smuggler back in Kabul and then, and then get on their way, they had to, um, the, you know, they had to say that they were uh, Georgians. The plan had been all along that, um, you know, when Luke and Yoel got to Jakarta, joined the other um, asylum seekers, that they would reveal their um, true identities to at least some of the people they were traveling with, tell them that they were journalists, they would be able to sort of, we imagined anyway, report um, on the sly uh, over the course of the journey. Uh, and then it became clear once they were in Jakarta that that w wasn't going to happen and I don't know maybe you want to talk a little bit about that yeah moment. yeah absolutely um yeah that was a huge issue um so at a certain point it, 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 in the safe house it became clear that you know if we told anyone that we were uh, on assignment it would get back to the to the smugglers pretty quickly and uh well, it put us at risk, but also we'd never get on the boat, which was the whole point. Um, and at that point, uh, you know, we really questioned uh, whether or not we should continue with the project or, or, or just cut our losses and go back to Afghanistan um, because of the, uh, you know, the, the troubling ethical problem of, of being undercover and reporting on people who don't know 
that you're reporting on them. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's troubling. I mean, ultimately we decided that the story warranted um, doing that and uh, it remains an uh, open question or a question for, you know, a legitimate question whether or not it did or didn't, but that was, that was the decision that we made. And, uh, and, and, and even at some point we thought, well, once we get on the boat, we can reveal our identities, but that turned out to be completely impractical because everyone was just throwing up the whole time and the engine was so loud you couldn't hear what anyone was saying anyway. And nobody would have, nobody would have cared. <laughs> And also, I will say, I, I should say that we did, part of our cover story was that we did say we were Georgian journalists. Oh, you did? No. I didn't know that. Because Yo Yoel was taking these photos the whole time. Right. And so, and we told them, you know, that he was a photographer. So, right. there's that. Right, <laughs> right. Um, okay, so then, so, so, so then the, actual, uh, the actual process of getting from the safe house you, know, you wait. You wait for as long as it takes for the smugglers to say, "Okay, well, we have enough people to put on our boat now." Mm -hmm. um, and as I remember, they're, they're sometimes for, for 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 reasons that are unclear. Some people think they're going to get on the boat, and then suddenly they're told they're not going. Um, but then once things start, once things get underway, explain how that process. Yeah. Works. So, that the other thing I forgot to mention about the wait is that. Oftentimes, people will go to the boat and get turned back for various reasons, and that actually happened to us. We, uh, we went, um, a group of us were, got the call that it's time. I mean, basically, the, every day you're just sitting by your phone waiting for the smuggler to call you and tell you that your boat's ready. And we got that call, and uh, we were packed into a, a convoy of SUVs and driven a, a, across Java to the coast and, um, and intercepted by the police, actually. Um, and uh, then the no, it was a very confusing situation. Nobody really knew what was going on. Ha we called Haji Sahib. He said he was taking care of it. At some point, the police brought us to this very remote village and, and just left us there. And everybody started kind of flagging down cars and trucks and buses and gradually working our way back to the safe house in Jakarta, which took the whole night. Um, and my, understand, my impression was that there was a problem with the bribes that later got sorted out, and that's why they, they just let, dropped us off in this village. Uh, so that happened to us. Uh, it can also happen that people will leave on the boat, and the boat founders very quickly. And, and, they ha and, and they get rescued by Indonesian police, then have to bribe those police. And are, okay. So that had happened to people we talked to. At any rate, eventually we did get on a boat, um, on, on this boat. And uh, it left in the middle of the night, and uh, we were to leave. They basically crammed us all in the bow and, and, and put a tarp over us and nailed down the tarp because there's people on the coast keeping watch. Uh, and by dawn, we were kind of on the open, open sea, and they let us out, and we traveled for, for about three days across, yeah, across the ocean. Um, how many people are on the boat? There were I, 57, I think, yeah, 57. And there were a bunch of kids, and I forget exactly the numbers, but it, uh, you can kind of see in the, in the stern there behind those little those little s steering stations, there was, the kids were all consolidated back there. And then the women, there was a covered bow, so the, the, the women and elderly were mostly in the bow, including, there was a seven month pregnant uh, woman. And, uh, and then everyone else was just kind of in this open deck area. Uh, I think it's, again, worth stopping for context here. So. Um, you know, so many, many times a year, these boats make this journey. Um, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I imagine you'll, you will be able to. Oftentimes, the boats fall apart in the open water. They sink. Uh, many people have drowned. Uh, if you can just give a little bit of, like, the context of, of yeah, just the danger of making the journey. It's known that over a 1,000 people have, have drowned. Probably a lot more have. Um, they're just not seaworthy vessels. They're, they're fishing boats meant for 
the stiller waters near the coastline, and they're also not uh, meant for such a load, so many people. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, it, it, it's dangerous, and they, they just, the water is constantly splashing in. You, I mean, for three days, uh, it's just miserable. I mean, everyone, there's no toilet, everyone's going in their pants, the women are going in their pants, the, the men just in the boat where you're all sleeping, or not sleeping. But uh, everyone's incredibly sick, and the, the heat, the sun is, is 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 very powerful, and people had heat stroke, and yeah, and so basically, I'll, I'll wrap it up here. But the, at at a certain point, when we got into uh, Australian territorial waters, a, a battleship came, and these guys uh, boarded the boat um, and brought us to Christmas Island. And uh, that's, that's me in the green shirt. <laughs> but uh, they brought us to Christmas Island, and every one of these people was, uh, was taken to a detention center, and after a few days, flown either to, um, to, to the Republic of Nauru or Papua New Guinea, uh, where they are still today. Um, for various policy reasons that maybe we can talk about or you can talk about. Um, but they're, they're, they're stuck there. They, they basically have two choices. They can either return, vol repatriate voluntarily to Iran or uh, allow Papua New Guinea or the Republic of Nauru to process their refugee applications. Uh, at that point, if, if, if their applications are found to be, uh, if they're found to be deserving of, of protection, to be legitimate refugees, they can resettle on those, in those countries. So in Papua New Guinea or on Nauru, which is essentially a phosphate mine. Um, and, uh, and, and Papua New Guinea has one of the highest murder rates in the world and is you know, one of the poorest countries in the world. None of them will ever get to Australia. This, yeah. So that's all right. That's so, so, so maybe maybe it's worth just wrapping up very quickly to explain why then, um, you know, why why do you think they do this? Why do people go through this? Yeah, it's. A, I mean, it's a tough so question. Simple. It's a tough question. It's not that they don't know that this is probably going to happen because they have access to that information and, and they do know. Um, they talked about it all the time, these policies um, of the Australian government. But they find various ways to um, explain, explain it away. They, they say, well, you know, maybe when a new government comes in, it'll change or it's all just kind of, they're, they're, they're trying to, it's, they're trying to prevent us from coming in the first place, but they won't actually do the, they won't actually send us to the Republic of Nauru. I mean, what kind of country would do that? And uh, they, they just managed to convince themselves that there's hope, basically, when there's not. If you haven't read the story, it's, it, it's of course really worth reading. It's an, it's an amazing, amazing piece of journalism, but there's one line in it that we were talking about earlier that John recalled, which is that, um, you know, one, the way you can sort of imagine why somebody would put themselves, put, put him or herself through something like this is that the, um, maybe the only thing worse than going through this journey is, is what they're experiencing in their home countries. Um, which is an important thing to keep in mind, I think, as you guys then talk more about the policy implications of all of this. Sure. Thank Thanks. you both very much, and hopefully my brief comments will pick up right where Luke left off, which is what happens under the law when asylum seekers of the, of the type whom you accompanied uh, arrive at their destinations. And the, the, the legal analysis turns mainly on two questions. The first is who qualifies as a refugee, and the second is uh, under what conditions is the country that receives these asylum seekers barred from returning them to their countries of origin? On the first question of who's a refugee, the 1951 Refugee Convention, which was then modified in 1967, lays out a clear definition that's used also as the basis for national asylum uh, laws around the world, which is somebody who has a well-founded fear of persecution on the basis of their race, religion, nationality, 
political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. And notice that the persecution has to be based on one of those five enumerated grounds. So when we're talking amongst ourselves, we commonly refer to people who are fleeing things like war, dire poverty, and natural disaster as refugees. But that's not the prevailing definition under the, under the law. Human rights organizations, scholars, many others, have tried to broaden that definition. And there are some examples of instruments in international law that do broaden it. For example, there's a 1969 treaty involving a number of African countries that includes war and other sources of generalized violence as a basis for uh, refugee status. There's also a declaration in Latin America uh, from the 1980s that has a similar provision in it. But by and large, nation states, especially the nation states who perceive themselves as being likely destinations of asylum seekers, have stuck to that traditional definition uh, in, in, in large part and tried to keep that window relatively narrow for who could qualify as a refugee and therefore be entitled to protection. Um, some of the most important contemporary debates at the national level are often questions over who falls into that category of a protected social group. For example, in a number of countries, including Australia, there's been recognition that women who have suffered from female genital mutilation are part of a protected social group. There are also cases in which gays and lesbians have been entitled to asylum in, in Western countries on the basis of persecution against them in their countries of origin. Um, but, and in the United States, there's now a robust debate, as many of you are familiar with, about whether young people who flee countries like Honduras or El Salvador and arrive at the southern border of the U.S. Uh, as part of an effort to escape gang violence in their neighborhoods should be entitled to uh, uh, treatment as refugees uh, based on that particular threat. Uh, I could come up with many more examples, but suffice it to say that there is still the general principle that fleeing general violence uh, or even dire poverty or natural disasters is not typically characterized as a basis for refugee status. And it's partly how, as Luke summarized at the end, there's so little legal hope for the people who accompany you because if they don't fall into those specified categories, uh, the law provides them uh, very little protection. Now there is a second way they could be protected, even if they're not determined to be refugees, and that's through the, the principle of non-refoulement, which is just a French word meaning we're not going to send you back to the place where you may face harm. Um, non-refoulement clearly does apply to people who are qualified as refugees, meaning that if you are determined to be a refugee, then you're, you cannot be sent back to the country where you may face persecution. But it also applies to people who may be uh, threatened with torture if they're repatriated. The Convention Against Torture includes that uh, provision. Uh, a number of international organizations, the UN Human Rights Committee, the European Court for Human Rights, and others uh, have agreed that, uh, that one's protection under the non-refoulement principle is not limited to refugees or designated people designated as refugees. What the law says a lot less about is how broadly beyond refugee uh, status or, or threats of torture the law would offer that protection. Are people protected under non-refoulement if the country that they come from is experiencing gang violence, is experiencing civil conflict and so forth? Uh, the law's murky in this area. Um, there's also a big question as to, as to whether a state can intercept asylum seekers outside of its own territory on the high seas and then repatriate them as a way of avoiding uh, the hands being tied by the non-refoulement principle. In the U.S., there's a famous 1993 Supreme Court decision that said eight to one that the uh, executive authorities in the U.S. could, in fact, intercept, in this case, Haitians on the high seas and return them to, uh, to Haiti, and that wouldn't violate uh, the refoulement principle. Um, more recently, in 2012, the European Court of Human Rights had to confront this question uh, in a case involving uh, Italian uh, Navy, uh, Navy and Coast Guard sending back North African uh, asylum seekers. Uh, and the European Court found, uh, contra to the 1993 U.S. decision, uh, that non-refoulement applies to uh, official agents wherever they are in the world, not just not just once asylum seekers uh, reach the soil of their intended destination country. Uh, but there's still debate over this. Uh, that European court decision isn't binding on Australia or on the United States. And in fact, uh, Australia, as we discussed earlier, Luke, Australia has used the US Supreme Court decision as one of the jurisprudential bases for this policy of the Pacific solution and, and the use of Christmas Island and Nauru and Papua New Guinea. The question then arises, well, 
if whether or not whether or not somebody uh, is able to uh, reach the territorial waters of Australia or not, can Australia uh, send asylum seekers to a third country like Papua New Guinea? The legal standard is that Australia can't do that or no country can do that if there's reason to believe that the third country would violate non refoulement and send the person back to uh, the country where they'd face persecution or if the asylum seeker would otherwise be treated uh, inhumanely or in violation of international human rights law. And so the debate here uh, surrounds whether or not Papua New Guinea is, has the ability and or the will to uh, process asylum claims well. And as we, as we discussed uh, uh, offline, they have very, very little experience in dealing with these kinds of cases. And so, and so uh, advocates for asylum seekers who have been sent there have challenged the Australian government uh, and argued that it has violated non refoulement on the grounds that it's sending people to a place where they will be treated poorly and where they, their asylum claims couldn't really be given uh, a fair vetting uh, by, the, by the PNG uh, authorities. All of this points to the fact that it's not just the substantive law that's on the books that's relevant to the fate of people like the ones whom Luke accompanied on the dreamboat, but it's also the way in which those laws are implemented, the way in which people are screened, the institutions who do the screening, what the national level policies are that inform those processes. And so I'm going to turn now to Susan, who's going to talk a little bit more about that subject. Thank you. So John mentioned the 1951 Refugee Convention, and alongside that convention, in a parallel uh, political discussion back in 1951, the world community decided, was faced with what to do with the number of refugees out of uh, World War II that were remaining, and also <laughs> refugees that were extending from the Cold War, emergent Cold War period. There was a big discussion about what kind of institution should be set up uh, to deal with that. And there was actually a much, a much stronger debate than you might have imagined. The Soviet Union was at least as adamant as others that there really was not a refugee problem that needed to be addressed and were very resistant to the idea of setting up uh, an international organization. The United States had its own views about how best to handle, and there was not really strong support for a very robust international um, organization. Nevertheless, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees was set up at that time as a very anemic organization, very small budget, always had to issue appeals for money rather on specific concerns rather than to have a, a really uh, large budget. Um, but the, the uh, Office of the High Commissioner was set up and it became one track or one of two tracks uh, for achieving refugee status. So, and I'll be, um, I'm, I'm setting this up now to be able to talk about what the options are for someone who is in desperate situations. So the existence of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees is one thing you need to know about. The other is that um, because the, the world community was not ready to really set up a central mechanism, it left to individual states to set up their own mechanisms for granting political asylum to, um, to whoever they really wanted to deem um, uh, qualified, as long as they adhered to the international rules that John described. So uh, no country could violate this, this um, uh, principle of customary as well as now treaty law of non refoulement So countries had to respect that, but apart from that, they were free to really set up their own um, their own system. So as a result, we have the system that runs through the UN High Commissioner of Refugees, and then we have a system uh, or multiple systems uh, created by 193 nation states. So every one of those countries can set up their own rules. So if you happen to be a refugee, or you happen to be actually not a refugee, but somebody in a terrible situation, and you think, I've got to get out of here, um, things are really terrible, not tenable, you have basically three options. There are variations on these themes, but you basically have three options. One is to say, my neighborhood is in shambles. I'm going to move next door. I'm going to move to a city. I'm going to find my relatives wherever they are um, in my country. But you don't cross an international border. You just move around and find uh, uh, a haven, maybe not a fully safe haven, and maybe not one where you've got 
uh, a lot of economic uh, possibilities, but it still may be your, your best and most immediate uh, move. If you end up staying in such a situation for a long period of time, you're likely to become labeled over time an internally displaced person, IDP. You could easily end up in a camp of some sort, you could still uh, receive services from the United Nations, but you are, until you leave an international, until you cross an international border, you're not uh, potentially a refugee. So IDPs, that's one option, is just moving around inside your own country. The second option that you have, the one that um, presents itself most immediately, is to flee across land to the nearest neighbor um, and um, find yourself through a safe passage, perhaps, or maybe even hiring a smuggler uh, to take you across to a neighboring uh, uh, country. Um, and if that host country is welcoming, you may find temporary shelter that's provided by that country. But if a large number of people are coming, chances are the United Nations uh, and all of its auxiliary agencies will be called in to help um, facilitate the arrival of large flows of, of people. So talking about now the UN High Commissioner of Refugees, but also the, um, the International Organization of Migration, uh, OSHA, uh, World Food Program, UNICEF, WHO, UN Habitat, they all can come into play, set up tents, tent cities, uh, provide uh, various kinds of, of relief for you. And ultimately, in this kind of a case, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees holds a very particular authority. They can certify you as a refugee and possibly prepare you for resettlement, but certainly in the meantime, uh, provide you with uh, the wherewithal for survival. Um, used to be they gave more uh, material. Now they're tending to give debit cards and, uh, and uh, vouchers for various services. The third option that you have is to make your way on your own to another country, and that's pretty much what your uh, uh, companions on your journey were doing. Uh, probably by air or by sea, if, you've, if you're a person of means and you've got uh, a, a passport and you've got credentials, whether or not you've got a visa into any place, as long as you've, you've got a passport, that's in a way a ticket out, uh, you've got the money to get yourself to some other country, then, you, then you've got a number of, of choices within that country. You can immediately ap apply for asylum, say I am, we qualify for one of these five categories or five uh, reasons to feel that we may face persecution back at home and we will immediately file for asylum. You may wait for a while. Many countries give you a year or so uh, grace period in which you can decide whether you're really just on a three-week holiday or you're here for good. Um, but you can apply for asylum and then go through that country's um, own procedures. And these three options, uh, obviously, depending on how much money you have, what kind of means you have available to you, uh, they may present themselves as more feasible one, one uh, over the other. The last comment I wanted to uh, make before, a set of comments really I wanted to make before we go back and, and open things up for a discussion is that the reason that we're talking about a crisis today is that uh, whereas in just recent memory we were talking about a mere 25 million people today, we're talking about 20, excuse me, we're talking about 51.2 million people that are on the move in this way. And they've taken one of these three options. It's a number that hasn't been seen since the period of World War II. And uh, people are, are in uh, serious uh, situations of desperation. Uh, today, roughly one out of every five people who is in a situation of either being internally displaced or having crossed an international border is from Syria, um, and there are five countries near Syria that are accommodating most of the, uh, the people who have made their way uh, outside the country. I, I should say before, um, 
before going on is that early when the regime was set up, when the international refugee regime was set up, resettlement was the ideal. About 20 years ago, that shifted quite a bit, and it's the international community views that, uh, and that international community is, is um, kind of code for uh, not just the United Nations, but also potential recipient countries feel that repatriation is a better uh, way forward um, for the good of the people who are leaving, but obviously also it alleviates quite a bit of the burden of the cost of, of resettling um, people. But anyway, we are in a crisis right now um, to the extent that 25% of the population of Lebanon is refugees. Um, and that's just as of about two years ago, uh, or of, uh, numbers that have accrued in the, in the last two years. And we are at a position where uh, there has been a pledge internationally by recipient countries to take 100,000 uh, of the existing refugees not just from Syria, but from the world. That's basically 1% of the Syrian crisis. So we have, we are really in a period where um, it's a very dark situation for the people who have already um, come to the decision that their lives are untenable. And um, the problem right now doesn't really seem to have any solutions on the horizon. Thanks, and so uh, hopefully you've all gotten your cards and have been able, if you have questions, to pass them uh, to the aisles. We have some, some folks waving cards to, to receive, but uh, if I could, I'd like to turn to our, uh, to our uh, question readers, to whom we're grateful, and maybe you could start off with a few questions for the panel. Uh, sure, we have a question here. Uh, we're gonna combine a couple of questions in some cases because they're similar. I'm Helen Maynard, I'm one of the Knight Wallace Fellows. Uh, for Luke, when you were looking into the story, uh, did you have the opportunity to stay in touch with any of the refugees? Have you uh, also been in touch with any of the smugglers? And to complete this mission, how did you work through the language barriers? And, and how did the refugees work through these language barriers on the boat trying to commission these services? So uh, the, both of the detention centers in, in Papua New Guinea and, and the Republic of Nauru are extremely opaque. They do not grant access to journalists. Uh, even email, all emails are monitored, and uh, it's even difficult for journalists to communicate by phone to any of the of uh, of the asylum seekers in these facilities. Uh, and aid workers as well, including the Red Cross, has, has difficulty um, accessing them. So, I haven't been in touch with uh, with them. No. And uh, although I do know that uh, some of them, uh, some of the people in the story are in, uh, in the facility on Manus Island in, in Papua New Guinea, which actually in, in February, maybe I should mention, had, a, had an extremely violent riot uh, where the, uh, the asylum seekers uh, attempted to escape and were very violently suppressed, and one Iranian man was beaten to death uh, with sticks, uh, and his, 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 his skull was later found to be completely crushed in um, by Australian and uh, Papua New Guinean uh, officials. So, the, so I do know that the situation there is bad, and. Uh, and, and that people from the story are there. But beyond that, I, I, I really don't know much. The language barrier, uh, you know, ev everybody speaks a bit of English now. And uh, I, Yoel and I both also spoke a bit of Dari, which is the, the language they speak in, Afghan in Afghanistan and is a, basically a dialect of Farsi, which they speak in Iran. Very limited Georgian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically how we navigated that. Um, I'm Abby Swanson. I'm also a Knight Wallace Fellow. I cover food and agriculture for NPR shows like Morning Edition and All Things Considered. Um, another question, which says it's for Luke, but it might also be for Susan or John. Um, wondering if you know what's happened in Australia. 
uh, since you filed this story in terms of um, asylum seekers and if the, that situation has changed there. Um, and Luke, whether you feel this experience filing this story has had a positive impact in a way, I know you were kind of talking about the ethical questions. Um, so I guess that's a more personal one. <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about this actually. Uh, the story has had no impact. Yeah, um, and the, the, the policies that were put in place um, have, have, if anything, become even more extreme. We went there, we, we made this trip in the midst of a national election, which, uh, which uh, put, made, made Tony Abbott prime minister, was it conservative? And basically, the, his whole campaign was centered around uh, stopping the boats. Uh, and he was going to, he, he promised voters that he would do that uh, with a program called Operation Sovereign Borders, which put, the, among other things, put the military in charge of, um, of interdicting uh, asylum boats like this at sea. And, um, and, and turning them back to uh, the countries they came from, whether it's Indonesia or Sri Lanka. And they've been doing that. May I add very briefly that uh, in July, or ju late June or early July of last year, uh, the Australian interdiction forces uh, intercepted a boat full of Tamils from Sri Lanka off Christmas Island. Uh, and and handed them over, or after, I, I believe there was an injunction and then later they handed them over uh, to the Sri Lankan Navy. Uh, and a case has been filed in the Australian High Court and the decision is not expected imminently but should come within the next several months. Uh, and that offers a possibility of a judicial challenge to the policies that Luke has described. Mm -hmm. And if I could just jump in here briefly just to, um, uh, this is gonna sound like I wrote in on a unicorn to say this, but. Um, so maybe I'm just trying to make Luke feel better, but uh, but but one thing that one thing the story did certainly do is um, in the middle of this election, especially, it uh, it generated an enormous mm -hmm. amount of attention and conversation, uh, a really extraordinary amount, and um, and it was already an issue that was quite um, uh, quite important to a lot of people in Australia. It was it was being discussed in the election a lot, but um, uh, but. In the aftermath of the story, that conversation, at least as far as I could tell from following it from afar, uh, you know, changed considerably. It was the first time that anybody, that any reporter had actually reported on the experience, the, the you know, the day-to-day, moment-to-moment experience of these people. And I think that it had, if not an effect on policy yet, uh, it, it certainly shifted the balance of the conversation in a way that you hope over time is going to matter. At least that's my sunny take on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just that while I'm sitting here, they're, they're, all these people are, are, are uh, in these horrible detention centers, um, all of them. And it's still true that taking a, an extremely hard line on immigration and boat people in Australian politics pays. It's always paid, and, and uh, that's still true. So to complicate the story, though, the policy story, um, I'm looking at a set of figures that uh, come from the UN High Commissioner on Refugees for 2013. And during <clears throat> that year, the UN resettled 71,000 people and Australia ranked number two in taking 15% of those that came through the UN channels. Um, so it's a, they're not allowing people in um, through their asylum process on the mm -hmm. seas, but they have, yeah. they have been generous in resettling people from the UN if they're referred as refugees out of the UN process. And the fact that there are these two different tracks kind of complicates things and makes it a little challenging to put together the whole picture. Hmm. The hmm. US, by the way, was the, the number one country for resettlement. 
Thank you. My name is Carlos Robles. I'm a, a student of public policy here at the Poor School, and my main interests are education and immigration. Um, so we have a question here for Susan Waltz saying, um, how would you rate the overall worldview on accepting refugees, and how far back can we trace the history of protecting refugees? Well, the last one is kind of easy, and then I think the word asylum goes all the way back to ancient Greece. It's mm -hmm. been, an, it's, and they're, they're um, there have been found manuscripts in Egypt that, you know, uh, uh, have the uh, idea, uh, reflect the idea of accepting people in who have been persecuted. So the, the idea of refugees and asylum go way, way, way back and are really anchored in customary law. How do people feel? Uh, I mean, that's a big question, I guess, but. Uh, I think a lot of the way that people respond to refugees has to do with identity and also has to do with um, economic uh, uh, opportunities, et cetera. We were talking a little bit before we came in here about um, open door policies. And, you know, it wasn't really such a long time ago in this country that just about anybody could come in through Ellis Island. And then as economic uh, situations change, uh, we have not necessarily been so open to the free movement of labor as a factor of, of production, so, and, and just even the, the human aspect of it. Um, the fact that 25, I, I'm sure that the Lebanese, who were very uh, welcoming uh, last year, probably don't feel quite uh, quite the same. And the last thing I will say here is that I remember being in Jordan in 2007 and how uh, welcoming the Jordan, uh, Jordan had been to Iraqi refugees when they had a lot of money. And then as the money <laughs> began to draw up, dry up, that they were not quite as, as ready. So it's a tough human question. OK. Um, Another question for you, Luke. For people who haven't read the story, maybe, because I think you touch on some of this in your story, uh, could you describe what happened at the end of the boat ride? Um, at what point did you part ways with the refugees? Was there a moment when they realized that you and your friend were going to receive different treatment and face a very different fate? Uh, yeah, the, the first contact we made with the, the, the Australian Navy on the third day was with one of these Zodiac uh, skiffs that came in and, and dropped off some jam and, uh, and water and life vests and declined, uh, by the way, to, to remove the pregnant woman who was in really bad condition or, or any of the other sick people. And then they left. They said we had to keep going. And uh, they, they, I don't know where they went, but we lost, we lost sight of them after a couple hours. And then uh, a few hours later, a, a, another boat came and boarded our boat. Um, and uh, a naval officer uh, took control of the, of the vessel. Um, and noticed Yoel's camera, because he was photographing the, the whole thing. And at that point, we had to identify ourselves. Uh, and and they, were, they were pretty surprised and, the, and separated us from everybody else and put us in the stern. So it was weird. We never really got to talk to um, the asylum seekers after that, because they kept us mm, sequestered from them up until the up until we actually arrived at the island and everyone was taken off the boat uh, and conveyed by a barge to the uh, to the port where all the immigration officials were waiting and police and and police and immigration officials were also waiting for us. Um, so. Yeah, that was it. They 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 interviewed us and uh, and and let us go. We had, I should say, we had visas. We had previously applied for visas uh, to 
to enter Australia. So legally, I guess we were we were covered there. And yeah, that was that was it. They were so everyone on the on the boat was taken to a detention center, and we went to a, a hotel. Okay, I think we're looking at our last question, and we've had a couple questions about policy in the United States. So we're looking at one here, and this is for the whole panel. Um, given some of the challenges that the United States has faced uh, at the Mexican uh, at the Mexican border uh, with refugees coming uh, from Central America from Mexico, um, the questions about security. What are the panel members' thoughts on how we are dealing with that situation and recommendations? Um, that besides building up the border uh, to keep people out, what would be some of the suggestions to deal with some of the security issues at our borders, our, at the American borders today? Well, let me start by saying that, that security is, considerations about security are built into refugee law internationally and also into domestic asylum law because uh, there's an enumerated list of things that can bar you from receiving asylum in this country or other forms of status and they include not only if you've been firmly resettled in another country or if your previous asylum application has been denied and conditions haven't changed demonstrably in your host country but also a whole bunch of security related criteria if you're a member of a designated terrorist organization if you've committed a felony in the US if there are other indicia that you'd be a threat to national security then you wouldn't be eligible for protection and so uh, given the fact that this is already built into the system, there's no reason in my mind to believe that you couldn't have uh, a, a very, uh, let's say, a welcoming policy with respect to asylum and treatment of refugees that wouldn't also be, be designed to account for these kinds of security conditions. Now, of course, there are other questions that people might ask about national security and its nexus to, to uh, movements of asylum seekers. Uh, that go beyond the, the sort of individual effects of applications that have more to do with, with uh, whether there's a surge of people and the U.S. isn't prepared to handle it administratively. Uh, I think that when we look at the numbers that we've seen to date, I don't want to say that that could never become a problem, uh, but the numbers we're talking about to date I think are very much within the means of the U.S. government to be able to handle. Uh, we're talking about, with respect to the recent migration of youth from Central America, something on the order of 63,000 arrivals. That's a lot, but it's not an order of magnitude above what the United States is used to processing. And in fact, uh, even in the absence of congressional action, there are some monies that the uh, executive can move around probably to be able to address that. So when I see the, the security concerns raised in, in connection with these uh, types of determinations, um, I'm, I'm skeptical of how much they, that they necessarily would change the approach that needs to be taken. I think it's, it's worth uh, adding something. The, the Knight Wallace Fellows recently went to Turkey, and although we couldn't visit the border because uh, the State Department had ruled it off limits for U.S. travel, we did hear a lot about it, and the Turks are now providing co a really quite amazing refugee accommodations for several hundred thousand refugees. Nobody knows how long it will go on, but it goes sort of unremarked uh, in the generally dispiriting situation among refugees. Do you, do you have familiar, familiarity with that one, either of you? Me? No, I'm no, really talking oh. to John. Well, with, with, the, with the Turkish situation, is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, um, a, little, a light familiarity, sufficient enough to know that actually Turkey has changed a lot of its laws uh, to basically, it, it is running the, the camps themselves. Uh, they're not having the, the United Nations um, uh, run them. And it has, it's been a, a big burden. And they're very disappointed that the world has not ponied up money to, to help them. But actually, it has not been a, a disruptive Relatively speaking, it has not been a disruptive um, situation. There are lots of arrangements in the world where there are open borders, porous borders. The EU countries have decided to not really monitor their borders inside the EU, and that works okay. We don't pay nearly as much attention to that northern border as we do to the southern border. And so um, I, I'm, my quick answer to the question is, is very much a political 
issue. It's not really a security issue. I mean, it's yeah. not a, a hard and fast security threat that we need to, to be facing. It's a, a veil for some other kinds of concerns, I think. Yeah, yeah I was just going to add that. I mean, our, the, 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 the post-Patriot uh, Act uh, asylum policies and procedures have, have become so xenophobic that we don't even allow people who worked for the U.S. military in Iraq and Afghanistan to come to the U.S. in many cases. Um, I mean, these are, so it's, it's not just uh, Central Asians and Middle Easterners who, who could potentially maybe sometime pose some threat to national security. I mean, it's, it's many people who demonstrably have, uh, have increased uh, na our national security and, and, and worked for our national security that are also having trouble um, getting to the U.S. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. I wanted to thank all of you for joining us. I hope you will stay and continue the conversation. We have a reception just outside at the Great Hall. And so if you would join me in thanking our panel and especially Luke Mogelson. Thank you. That was really fabulous.